And thank you very much for all for joining us. And I look forward uh, to having this very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Rocco Giansante, and I'm the head of uh, um, the Italian desk at the International School for Holocaust Studies uh, here at Yad Vashem. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, moderate this evening, and also a, a great pleasure to see so many people from all over the world um, joining us uh, to uh, remember and also commemorate uh, this uh, tragic event in the history of uh, the Jewish community in Rome. Uh, before we start, I just want to give a few uh, service messages. Uh, the event has been recorded, so if for whatever reason you don't want to uh, appear in the, in the video, I invite you to, uh, to switch off your camera. And then uh, the um, panelists have agreed to answer uh, questions. And so uh, in order to do this and to, to make sure that the, the event runs smoothly, I would uh, uh, ask you to please uh, write your questions uh, using uh, the chat function at the bottom of, uh, of the window. And then we will, I will read the questions uh, at the end of the, the first part of the, of the evening and, uh, and we will address your, the panelists will address your questions. So um, tonight, uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna focus and uh, analyze and also retell uh, a story uh, that has marked uh, the lives of, of Jews in, in Rome. It's uh, the Randa that happened on October 16, 1943. Uh, we're, gonna, um, we're gonna retell the events and also see how uh, these events are still uh, kind of reverberating, uh, not only inside the Jewish community in Italy, but also in the wider uh, society uh, in Italy. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we have um, gathered here uh, three experts of um, Italian Jewry each one in his own right, each one in a specific field, and uh, each one specialized in specific topics. So we have all the, um, uh, we have all the arguments uh, covered, and I will present them tonight, starting from uh, Dr. Yael Nidam Orvieto. Uh, uh, Dr. Nidam Orvieto is currently the director of the International uh, Institute for Holocaust Research here at Yad Vashem, and she's also a lecturer at the Hebrew University. Uh, Dr. Orvieto um, is, uh, received her PhD at the Hebrew University, and she's uh, specialized in the history of uh, Italian Jews during fascism and, and the Holocaust, and on Jewish responses during the Holocaust, on Jewish leadership, the Vatican and the Holocaust, and rescue attempts during uh, the, uh, the, the Shoah. Uh, she, is, she has won many grants, and, and she's been a research fellow not only at Yad Vashem, but also at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, at the University of Pisa in Tuscany, and at the Memorial de la Shoah in, in Paris. Uh, she is also a recipient of many prizes uh, given by the Shlomo Grass and Fanny Balaban Grass Fund, by the Bensvi Institute, by the uh, Olivier Vaudos Fund. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Nita Morvieto. Our second speaker is Professor Sergio Della Pergola, who is Professor Emeritus um, uh, from the Hebrew University. He was uh, chairman of the Avram Alman Institute for Contemporary Judaism. Uh, Professor Della Pergola is a world-renowned expert in Jewish demography, and he has uh, authored over 300 scholarly articles and 60 books. Aside from uh, his uh, academic career, he has been a senior policy consultant to uh, the president of Israel, to Israeli governments, and to various uh, national and international organizations. He is the uh, recipient of the Marshall Sclair Prize and also of the uh, Michael Landau Prize. And he's also a member of Yad Vashem's Committee for the Righteous um, uh, of the Nations. 
And uh, our uh, last but not least, our third uh, speaker tonight uh, will be uh, Simonetta della Seta, who is joining us directly from Rome. Uh, Simonetta is a scholar, a diplomat, a journalist, and a, uh, a, an historian. She studied history with the renowned historian Renzo De Felice in Rome, and she's uh, an expert in the uh, history of Israel and history of the Jewish people, also the relationship between fascism and, and Zion, Italian fascism and Zionism. She, uh, she's an expert of, uh, of uh, politics in the Middle East, and she has written on many uh, newspapers and, uh, and reviews. Um, aside from that, uh, it, uh, she was also a uh, cultural attaché to the Italian, um, at, at the Italian embassy uh, here in, uh, in Israel from uh, in, uh, 2004 to 2015. And lately, she was the director of the National Museum of Italian Jewry in Ferrara. And uh, uh, she will soon uh, take over the post of uh, director of the European Department at the International School for Holocaust Studies here uh, at Yad Vashem. So these are our uh, speakers tonight that I thank again for participating and giving their time. And I will start uh, by asking uh, Dr. Um, Yael uh, Orvieto uh, to uh, please give us uh, uh, an historical overview of um, of what happened on that uh, Shabbat morning, that Saturday morning, October 16, 1943. Thank you. Yes, uh, good evening um, and welcome. Uh, okay, I have a, a, a few minutes to give uh, some kind of overview of what happened in, the, in that uh, day of the 16th of October, what is uh, known in the, in the uh, uh, collective memory of Italian Jewry as the Black Shabbat, uh, the Black Sabbath, uh, ex exactly because of what uh, Rocco just said, uh, the, the roundup uh, of the Roman Jews uh, happened on a Saturday morning at five o'clock in the morning, it started until uh, 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 two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, now, this roundup of, of, uh, of the October 16, it became a symbol of the Holocaust in Italy, although already before uh, the 16th of October, Jews were already uh, rounded up and, and uh, arrested and later uh, deported uh, in other parts of, of Italy, in the north of Italy. So uh, we have already arrests uh, before. Uh, but this roundup uh, was uh, uh, the, the largest uh, one uh, and became the most uh, uh, notorious uh, one. Now we have to remember that we uh, the, the background Roundup is extremely uh, important uh, to understand uh, the context in which it happened. Of course, uh, uh, immediately after uh, the invasion, the German invasion of, of Italy in September uh, 1943, uh, we see a direct order that arrives to Rome to Herbert Kapler, uh, one of the commanders of the SS in, in Rome, uh, 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 an order uh, to organize basically the arrest uh, and the uh, deportation of the of the, uh, the local uh, Jewish community, and we see that already uh, uh, on the 26th of September, we see the first maybe the first stage of this background when uh, when uh, we see uh, that Kapler uh, um, in, uh, asked orders. Uh, uh, the, the heads of the Jewish community, uh, he threatens them, uh, basically, uh, that if they will not bring a 50 uh, uh, kilograms uh, gold ransom uh, within a very, very short uh, uh, time, uh, Jews will be uh, deported. And we see uh, uh, that there is a, a day and a half of extreme activity to try to gather uh, uh, these 50 kilograms of gold. Uh, the, the local population, the non-Jewish population also uh, uh, contributes uh, to this um, extremely uh, stressful uh, um, uh, days and uh, the 50 kilograms of gold uh, are eventually uh, reached and uh, brought to the to the Germans. So this is uh, extremely uh, uh, important because the fact that the Germans uh, uh, threatened and requested the gold and received the amount, even actually even a little bit more than the 50 kilograms of gold, created a, some kind of a, a feeling of security. Many Jews in Rome felt that 
the Germans received what they wanted. And therefore, it created an illusion uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, security. Of course, uh, uh, several days after uh, 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 other steps uh, were taken, and we see, for example, uh, uh, the, the Germans arrived at the offices of the, of the Jewish uh, uh, community, uh, stealing and confiscating the, the old, very old uh, Jewish library with the, the ancient manuscript, etc., etc. They, of course, also take the lists of, of the Jews, which are very important, although they had al already other lists uh, uh, received by uh, Italian fascist authorities. This is a very important uh, uh, piece of, of information because uh, the, the, the uh, lists of the, of the Jews uh, that were uh, uh, made already since 1938, meaning the beginning of the anti-Semitic uh, legislation, fascist uh, uh, anti-Semitic legislation, these were the lists that were the base for the arrests, not only in Rome, uh, also later in, in other cities. So we see here the beginning, uh, the, the base of the five years of anti-Semitic legislation of 1938-1943 are extremely important to understand uh, the background of the uh, uh, roundup of the 16th of October and, and uh, so on. So as I said, the, the, uh, um, the majority of the Jews uh, of Rome remain in their homes and uh, hoping that the Germans uh, receive what they wanted and, and probably uh, trusting the Italians, the, the authorities, the fascist authorities, the Vatican, trusting that they would protect them in case of dangers. So, so this is a very uh, important uh, point because the Jews were uh, for, for, for the most part in their uh, homes. And on the morning of the 16th of October, uh, within a few hours, uh, um, we see that uh, um, 1,250 1, Jews uh, were arrested, the majority of which uh, it was women and children. We, we are talking about uh, almost 700 uh, women, uh, uh, 363 men, and uh, around 207 children. Um, and we could discuss, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the gap between uh, women and men. We, of course, do not have uh, so much time. They, they, all these arrested, uh, uh, they, they, they were arrested very violently, of course, as we know from other places uh, throughout Europe. Uh, we have an amazing uh, text that describe uh, uh, this uh, uh, roundup, these horrible hours uh, uh, in a very important book that was a, a, a text that was uh, published uh, very soon uh, after the liberation and actually recently has been uh, 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 published in uh, Hebrew by uh, uh, Giacomo de Benedetti uh, that talks, describes in an amazing way uh, uh, the, the tragedy of that uh, uh, day, of, this, uh, of those uh, hours, uh, and brings us in the atmosphere of what, uh, uh, of what happened. And, and those Jews uh, arrested, they are brought uh, to a very close uh, uh, place uh, to the military um, uh, college school, uh, and which is very, very close to the Vatican also, which uh, raises a lot of, of course, of questions about the reaction of, of the Vatican to this uh, uh, arrest, to this roundup, um, and kept there uh, for almost two days. Uh, in uh, very bad conditions, of course, very harsh condition. A baby is born in this place. A baby is born and after a day is deported to Auschwitz with all the, uh, the people. Only a, 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 some people are released. Uh, some of them are non-Jews that were arrested by mistakes. Some are uh, married or, or uh, children of uh, uh, mixed uh, uh, marriages. And a few others are able uh, uh, miraculously uh, to be released. And the rest, more than 1,000 Jews, are deported to Auschwitz on the 18th of the, uh, October. And uh, the majority is killed uh, upon arrival. And uh, from this, uh, over 1,000 Jews only uh, 16 uh, will return, uh, one, only one of them is a woman, one of the women that were uh, arrested. When uh, maybe only one last sentence, uh, um, if you allow me, is the question of the reaction of the population. Uh, this roundup uh, happens in an early stage 
when uh, the, the, the fascist republic of Mussolini, of the you know, Salo Republic, didn't still uh, um, started the, 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 the st second stage of the uh, persecution, the stage of the total participation in arrests uh, uh, of Jews. So uh, uh, because the stage didn't start yet, the, the local population is, is surprised and he, he reacts to this a roundup of the Jews uh, with a lot of uh, surprise and it doesn't know how to react necessarily. We have to remember also a very important event that happened actually just 10 days before on the 7th of October. Uh, uh, the, the, um, the Germans arrest over 2,000 uh, uh, Italian carabinieri uh, because they were believed to be unfaithful and untrustful, and, and therefore they were arrested with Italian collaboration. And uh, this happened in Rome too, 10 days before this roundup of the Jews. The population was in shock. This influenced the, 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 the atmosphere. There is no doubt that this influenced also the reaction of the population to the roundup of the Jews. And therefore, in this uh, roundup, we see many cases of instinctive assistance and help to the Jews, uh, cases of, of uh, neighbors that just grab the, the Jews and pull them inside their apartments. Uh, uh, and also we see many cases of Jews that try to escape during the roundup and receive help uh, uh, from people in the street because the feeling is of a shock or surprise and a, a lot of confusion. Now, of course, we have to, to remember that uh, after this roundup, uh, other roundup uh, will uh, happen in other cities, Florence, et cetera, et cetera, going northern uh, uh, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, and of course, many more Jews later on will be arrested by the Germans and by the Italians, many by the Italians, and many will be also arrested uh, as a result of denunciation, denunciation by Italian citizens. So there is also a change with time and things become a more and more a, a, a complex. But the whole picture of, of this specific roundup of the 16th of October it remains in the collective memory is a very, very important and, and, and traumatic event because of a, a, we are talking about such a large a, a, a event, a roundup and uh, so uh, tragic and traumatic because uh, besides 16 uh, Jews, the rest were uh, killed uh, uh, in Auschwitz. Uh, so this is very briefly um, the, the main uh, um, uh, information about uh, this uh, roundup. Uh, thank you, Dr. Emilia Morvieto, for this overview. And uh, you talked about um, over a thousand Jews rounded up. And so I would like to uh, take the opportunity to ask uh, Professor Della Pergola to give us uh, um, an idea of, of the numbers. How many Jews lived in, uh, in Rome uh, uh, at the time of the Holocaust and also before? And, um, and what, what makes this community so, uh, so unique? It's one of the most ancient in the, in the diaspora. So um, also in comparison with other Jewish communities in Italy, what, is, uh, what, what makes the Jewish community in Rome uh, so uh, different? Thank you. Thank you, Rocco, um, and thank you all. Uh, indeed, uh, we have to put uh, things in a kind of historical context. Uh, Rome, in fact, has one of the most ancient uh, Jewish communities in the Western world. It has existed since uh, uh, the time of the Second Temple, and uh, there has been a non-interrupted presence in Rome for uh, about 2,200 years uh, of Jews. Uh, the numbers have fluctuated uh, widely during the Roman Empire. There was a very big community, very noisy and very well, uh, sometime uh, with some hostility uh, described by the historians, by the Roman historians uh, of, the, of the time. Then, then Rome decayed and uh, from a huge uh, metropolitan center, it became a very marginal city. The Jewish population uh, declined uh, accordingly. But what is more relevant to us is that uh, uh, Rome eventually was part of the domain of the Pope. Uh, 
uh, Italy did not exist as a unified country. And the domains of the Pope, the state of the church, was one of the most backward states uh, among the different provinces of Italy. And the situation of the Jews uh, was very bad. Rome was, in fact, uh, perhaps the poorest uh, Jewish uh, community uh, in Italy. Uh, it has to be noted that uh, Rome was, in fact, uh, uh, united to Italy only in 1870. And only then uh, the Jews of Rome got uh, finally emancipation. We can say that uh, the Jews of Rome are the last in the whole of Europe who formally uh, were uh, emancipated. Uh, Rome, uh, though, in, uh, immediately after, uh, that is in 1870, had become the capital of Italy. And so, in fact, it uh, included two types of persons. The uh, descendants of, of a very ancient community, uh, which had been, as I said, very much impoverished. And then the people, the mobile people who were joining the capital uh, were part of the bureaucracy. Uh, emancipation in the center and north of Italy uh, had brought it to a very interesting, uh, quite amazing process of social integ integration and upward mobility. And, and Jews, what is uh, quite unique, were militant in the bureaucracy of the state. Uh, they were uh, senior citizens in terms of their uh, roles in the in the public sector and in the army. You, you have lots of, uh, of, of, of Jews who joined the army. They became generals and uh, very visible. One Jew was, in fact, the personal secretary to the king of Italy, uh, who had said, I appoint a Jew because Jews are honest and loyal. But this was not really the situation of the Jews in Rome. Uh, very petty merchants uh, and peddlers and uh, people um, often with a very low level uh, of education. And so uh, we have to understand uh, that the situation was, uh, was quite bad uh, even before the persecution. The persecution came in 1938, as Yael has noted, and uh, it points, uh, in fact, to the fact that uh, not, not, not only the Germans are responsible, but the Italians had their role uh, too. Uh, what perhaps um, uh, is not uh, typical in other countries of the world is the centralization of the Jewish community, not a voluntary body, but uh, an institution which is established by law and uh, to which uh, the participation of members is compulsory. So all of the Jews were uh, part of the community. There was a central register of all of the names of the Jews, in addition to the national census of Jews that had been carried out in 1938. And so the Germans could have at their uh, disposal a very accurate lists of Jewish families with addresses and occupations and, and other details. And so their action uh, was uh, much easier than under uh, different uh, circumstances. Uh, what um, happened uh, Yael has uh, already uh, described. Um, the numbers in Rome at the time uh, were about between 12,000 and 13,000 uh, people. Uh, in fact, at the beginning of the century, um, there were only seven to 8,000 Jews. That is, the population was, was growing, part of which because of the higher uh, birth rate, part of which uh, because of some uh, immigration. But, but again, overall, uh, the action, the raid of the, of the ghetto of Roma um, um, uh, touched upon uh, uh, a population which already had, uh, in general, uh, lots of problems. The, the reactions, in a sense, uh, reflect also this situation. Some of them had very good social networks and uh, perhaps were um, uh, in an easier position to, to escape, to hide, uh, to find help. Uh, others were, were very strongly concentrated in the Jewish neighbor. Uh, next to the river, where in fact the ghetto had been uh, in existence, uh, then the ghetto had been disbanded, but still uh, in the sort of reconstructed neighborhood, uh, there were many Jewish families. So to some extent, it was uh, easier to, for, for the Germans uh, to operate in that context. And then, in fact, the, the fate, and here I, I may add uh, uh, just a comment uh, based on my experience, uh, and, and Yael too is a member uh, of the uh, committee for the writers of, of the nations, is the, uh, the very different uh, fate and, and uh, to some extent uh, undescribable and uh, uh, unexpected fate uh, of people uh, when uh, some uh, just by chance, just by, by random and, and fortune, uh, could escape and find hiding uh, among people they had never met before, uh, whereas others had uh, been able to organize themselves and to move uh, to more remote locations and so to reduce uh, the risk. 
um, in terms of those who helped, uh, you find people who were very high located and people who were very poor. There is not a social profile of the writers who helped uh, th those Jews of Rome uh, whom they could help. Uh, there were people who were very Catholics and, and people who were anti-Catholics. And, and, and a final word perhaps on, on, on the church, but before that one word that has to be said and which is pure drama. The rabbi of Rome, who was a Galician Jew uh, named Israel Zoller and had changed his name into Italo Zolli, uh, had uh, warned the community and had said, uh, look, uh, I, I know the Germans, I come from, from Central Europe, uh, go to hiding. The Jewish community committee had said, no, nothing may happen to us because we are Italians, we, we are uh, well connected, um, there is no such a risk. Uh, well, the rabbi said, I told you, I will go to hiding. And in fact, he disappeared. And then uh, the tragedy happened. And then uh, when uh, the rabbi came back uh, just at the end of the war, and he said, I, I wish to be reinstated in my position, uh, the Jewish Community Council say, no, no, you have left us uh, in the moment of danger. We don't want you. And then the final act of the drama is that Rabbi Soler converted to Catholicism, passed to live in the Vatican and lived thereafter as a librarian uh, in uh, the Vatican, not, uh, after, not before having taken the name of Eugenio, which was the name of the reigning Pope, Pius XII. Uh, thank you, Professor de la Pergola. Um, you talked about uh, the righteous, and uh, so I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Yael Orvieto um, about uh, how the Italian Jewish community in general, not just in Rome, returned to life after, after the Holocaust. So we've seen uh, these stories of, uh, of, of, of rescue and w what happened to the Jews of Italy after, after the Holocaust. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, well, the aftermath is an extremely painful chapter, of course, for the Jews who survived. First of all, we must remember, and, and, and uh, uh, Sergio also mentioned uh, a few aspects, uh, that the, the, the Jewish community in Italy uh, was shrunk. Uh, by half almost uh, since 1938 uh, because of immigration of Jews, uh, of uh, conversions uh, to Catholicism and of course uh, the deportations and the, the killing of, uh, uh, of Jews uh, also in Italy. So it's, it's the, a community that went through seven years of, uh, of discrimination, humiliation, separation, of course persecution, increasing uh, persecution and in the last two years, a, a, a systematic uh, manhunt, uh, of course, and denunciation, as uh, was mentioned, also uh, 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 with the arrest uh, and deportation. So, uh, as, as uh, Sergio uh, mentioned, many Jews were, in fact, assisted and rescued by very courageous uh, uh, Italians, right? But in other cases, Italians remained indifferent. And in other cases, uh, uh, they willingly participated in the manhunt. So waking up from this long period was extremely painful and we must of course uh, uh, divide the practical aspect of returning to life and here we see from both uh, the, the uh, community level and the collective uh, level we see a lot of activity to uh, uh, reorganize to assist the, the families the individuals to try to understand what happened to those who were uh, deported uh, also to the, 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 the attempts to assure the abolition of, of the anti-semitic laws it sounds so logical but it was not such an easy process and actually in fact it took years and sometimes decades uh, until every aspect of the, uh, um, of the uh, anti-Semitic and the effects of the anti-Semitic uh, legislation were uh, actually uh, abolished. So this is a very long uh, uh, process. We also see of course uh, different uh, assistance of uh, a, a international organization, Jewish organization, uh, the, the Jewish soldiers that come from the land of Israel and assist uh, in this process. And later on, when after the liberation uh, of all Italy and after the end of the war in Europe, we see that Italy actually becomes a center of DPs, of uh, uh, displaced uh, uh, persons, meaning survivors that arrive uh, through Italy in the attempt to 
emigrate somewhere else. They don't want to stay anymore uh, uh, in their uh, uh, homelands and they search for a new uh, place. And Italy becomes a very central uh, place for all these uh, uh, aspects. Uh, and we see that uh, the local communities also are asked to, uh, to uh, uh, assist. But from the, the personal level and also the community uh, level, um, there is also the emotional, the, the question of the identity. Who are we? Who am I vis-a-vis -vis the Italian society, vis-a-vis -vis a country that officially announced that I am an enemy, that I uh, have to be arrested and deported? So a, a, a country that ignored the long history of patriotism, and Sergio mentioned it very uh, uh, clearly, right? So how to cope with these feelings of betrayal by neighbors, by uh, 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 former friends, by the country that they love so much, right? And how to relate to this uh, pain and, and, uh, and, and also the question of, of anti-Semitism, deep anti-Semitism disappear after the war. And we do know that uh, even some anti-fascist activists uh, did not hesitate to express anti-Jewish opinions in the aftermath. So this is a very complicated story, right? So, and, and we see a, a very different reaction in, in different age groups. So we have the older generation that, that, that strives to, to go back to normalcy, to reattack, to reconnect uh, to the Italian society, assisted by the fact that uh, Italy, the Italy of the Resistenza, is an Italy that can be easily uh, uh, um, attract uh, the Jews because, of course, the Jews would feel uh, uh, that this is the Italy, the real Italy, uh, basically. So this is a very uh, uh, um, um, important aspect of the reconnecting uh, uh, to life. For the younger generation, this is often much more complex. This is a, a generation that was um, thrown away from school and therefore uh, uh, um, the, the, the questions of identity sometimes are burning even more so we see a, a Jews that will react by choosing a political choice, communism, socialism, others will, uh, uh, will turn into a, a Zionism uh, and others uh, uh, in other directions some will leave Italy and by the way, some actually will return to Italy. Some of the Jews that emigrated after 1938 will actually come back. So this is a very, very complex uh, uh, topic. Rocco, if you allow me, I would like to share a, a very powerful uh, a quotation from a diary, a, a wonderful diary of uh, Silvia Lombroso uh, that was uh, recently republished in Italian, and we are working on a publication in Hebrew also. Um, uh, Silvia Lombroso, a few days after the uh, liberation, she writes in her diary like this, we are alive. It is not enough. The racial laws are abolished. We can begin to think about a future again, to restore the fragments of our destroyed life, to look forward to the day when we will be able to see you again, children, the children emigrated to the States. Yet we walk slowly and a little bent. We look into each other's eyes without joy. We painfully rise to the surface. Maybe it's just this fatigue, fatigue, fatigue. Or maybe the reason is much more intimate and profound. Too much blood, too much pain, too much destruction, too many sh shadows have accumulated in us and around us and still surround us and torment us. This return to life has cost us too much and we are still at the bottom of an abyss where yesterday's shame and today's suffering weigh on those who are children of this miserable country. And even today, that the thin wave that binds us to the other beings is rewinding around us. Even today, that from the fragment of our new life, a new, more thoughtful, deeper life is about to arise, still today for many of us, some, something not precise, not very clear, something that must be said and was not said, remains subtle and bitter in the still suffering soul. Perhaps our, beyond what we glimpse in the agony of our hopes, in the collapse of our certainties, was too sad, too inhuman. And from the look that have, we have thrown at it, this bitterness and this discomfort arose. And now we would like to forget 
the look that was avoided, the encounter not sought, the offer that was not made. And then look at how she switches this feeling and she says, but no, it is not this, no resentment, no pessimism veils our miraculous resurrection to life. And so this is an extremely powerful quotation which shows the complexity of the feeling and of the pain and the anguish of Sylvia and many others Jews. So this painful process can, we can see later on the need sometimes not to talk, concentrate on rebuilding, sometimes adopting a selective memory of what happened ignoring the years of 1938 and 43 and the pain suffering those years and concentrating only on the years of 43, 45. This is an extremely uh, uh, interesting uh, topic that of course we cannot uh, uh, analyze uh, um, uh, now, but uh, indeed uh, we, can, we can see a very uh, um, a painful process of rejoining and, and returning to life for the Italian Jewry. You are on mute, Rocco, you are on mute. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so we've seen how, how difficult and painful is this process of restoring the fragments of destroyed lives. And uh, so after the war, uh, with, with time, uh, the, this event of October 16 and also the Holocaust in general uh, enters in the collective memory of the, of the Jewish community and also wider society. And I would like to ask Simonetta della Seta to, to tell us um, how uh, the Jews in Rome commemorate this date uh, today, but also uh, the Jews uh, in Italy, uh, sorry, the, 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 Jews, the Italian Jews here in Israel, and then uh, also how the, the state, the Italian state commemorates or marks uh, this, this date. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, well, uh, very much felt here in Rome, very, very much. And um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a time uh, where the Roman Jews feel that they want to be together. There is no, actually no family um, that hasn't go through this trauma here. So what happens is that the, um, the Romans gather for their Um, and listen to their stories and uh, this is the main point is to transmit what happened from one generation to the other and this is also why um, this event has also been chosen by the um, Jewish Italian community in Israel as a symbolic uh, date for the Italian Holocaust the Italian Shoah so, uh, and, and this is why in Israel, the, um, is not the Italian embassy or the Italian authorities organizing at the Yad Vashem, but it's the Italian uh, communities, the Italian Jewish community organizing the event. So first of all, we have uh, the Jews organizing the event in Rome, the Jews organizing the event uh, in Yad Vashem. This is extremely um, meaningful because um, it's, it's of transmitting a memory, and transmitting something that has been, um, has marked so heavily the history of the Roman Jews. Now, um, in addition to that, uh, the date is felt by the city of Rome. And uh, since many, many years, I cannot count how many, um, by uh, an initiative of the community of Sant'Egidio, which is a solidarity community uh, based in uh, Trastevere, in, uh, in a church, is, is a Catholic solidarity community. Uh, there is a march of uh, the citizen from Trastevere, the other river, the, the other side of the river, into the Jewish quarter um, and, uh, and, and with torches. And these are non-Jews, non-Jewish people marching into 
Jewish Quarter um, as a solidarity um, action. So this is what is happening in Rome, and usually um, not during the COVID time, but usually there are also many, um, I would say, many institutional uh, events organized by the government, by the authorities, um, and also the Italian television is broadcasting uh, different uh, documentaries and, um, and memories, testimonies around October 16. Now, there is a reason why um, I believe this date was chosen by the Italian community in Israel and was not chosen by the Jewish community in Italy as a symbolic date. Um, because um, it had a terrible impact on the Jews of Rome, um, a terrible, was a tra terrible trauma. Um, however, it was the beginning and there were many Jews also living in the North. You see in September, though in September 48, something terrible happened in Italy. Uh, the, the king, after signing a truce with the allied forces, uh, which were coming from the south, conquering Italy from the south, um, escaped. So Rome, uh, since n n September 9th, was without a government and without a king. And that's when the Germans came in and occupied Rome. And this was a terrible, um, that was a real, I mean, a terrible betrayal, of course, with the anti-Jewish laws in 1938. This was the, was the time when all the Italian Jews felt uh, after so much to their country. In the, in, in, during the, the Risorgimento, during the First World War, um, but then, um, the occupation, so the Jews were already living not in a normal way, limited, but the um, occupation by the Nazis and this, um, this roundup in Rome was a terrible surprise, especially as it was said for the Jews of Rome, who in many ways hoped that being so close to the Pope, um, you know, they, they had been years. So they were sure, even if close in the ghettos, they were sure that somehow this would protect them. It didn't. But as what I was saying is that there were many other, uh, for example, from the north of, of Italy, um, the Jews were silent. We know in Milano now we have a memorial the Jews were deported in Fos from Fossoli, from Trieste, from the Risiera. So it's uh, uh, the Italian Jewry. So there were many other episodes. However, um, the this event um, is uh, is extremely studied, and uh, in addition to commemorations, in addition to uh, let, let me try this and let's see if you hear me better, okay? Uh -huh. Is this better? Yes, it seems so, thank you. Right. So, uh, in addition to this, um, uh, people are still studying what happened, okay? I'm glad that uh, um, uh, Yael described the aftermath of the war, but we all know that it took a long time until the people started to speak. You know, I remember when I was young and I come from a family um, uh, who had, um, um, I mean, there were six people deported on that day. Nobody spoke about this. It took us years. It took us generations. It, it, we had to wait for the 
questions of our children in order that our parents would speak. And uh, so the, um, uh, it, it, the, the event was extremely traumatic and it took a long time to study and to understand what happened. And this is luckily um, happening until now. Um, the Center for Contemporary Jewish Documentation in Milano, CEDEC, is still working on documents on October 16th. Um, I spoke to uh, Dr. Liliana uh, Picciotto, who wrote the book of Remembrance of the Italian Jews, and she will publish on Yad Vashem Studies, next number of numbers, uh, Yad Vashem Studies, a study on, based on documents uh, released by the Secret Service of the United States and based on documentation given to them by the Secret Services of United Kingdom. And these documents, we would read this essay and she anticipated a few things to me. So you see, it's a never, it, in Italy, there's no, only a commemoration. There's still a need to understand what happened, why it happened, who gave the orders, what happened to the people, who gave, who helped, and who didn't help. And, and this is still on through three generations, it's still on. And uh, myself, for example, I'm sitting in the archives of the Jewish communities this day in order to look for some information related to my family and other people are doing the same. So it's not only a commemoration, it's not something far away. It's very, very much alive, it's very, very much with us. And it's extremely important, we believe, that non-Jews in Rome are also connected to this. The fact that Thousands of people march every year from one side of the river, the bank of the river to the other side of the river, get into the Jewish quarter. They, they haven't been through this, but they believe they should do it because it's something terrible that happened in this city, in Rome, where the Jews were here for more than 2,200 years. So this is a shock and the shock is coming is also getting to other people who are not Jews. And, and this is something important, is something important because at the end of the day, the Holocaust, was, it, it's relating to the Jews, but it, it's a problem for those who perpetrated, for those who created this monster in their society. So the fact that the Roman Jewish community is gathering outdoor and is, and, and other people are coming and, uh, and the people are still working on documents and are still releasing facts and documents. This is extremely important, especially in a time when there is so much fantasy around the Holocaust. We need to stick to the facts and we need to continue studying what happened and there is still a lot to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Simonetta della Seta, for um, this uh, overview of what, what is happening in Italy and these reflections on uh, perpetrators and, and the role of the Holocaust in wider societies, not just in Jewish circles. Uh, you talked about uh, briefly uh, uh, about the story of, of your family. Uh, so I want to now just ask all the panelists uh, a last question and then open it to the public. And in, in light also of your personal stories, you are all... Um, uh, Italian Jews, uh, and what what is um, what is the what role does the Holocaust play in uh, contemporary uh, Italian uh, Jewish identity? Um, if you can, yeah, if you can give us uh, your personal take on this, also in uh, in connection with what happens, uh, for example, in the United States, where also there uh, the Holocaust plays an important role in the identity of uh, of, of Jews. Thank you. I, I would start with uh, Simonetta della Seta and then move on to Professor della Fergola and uh, Dr. Yalorieto. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, it's, um, it is clear that what happened to, to my family on that day and in general 
on that uh, during the Second World War had an impact, had an impact on our life. And um, in my case, I think I, I always looked, I didn't want to belong and to, to I didn't want to be Jew because of this negative trauma. I, I wanted to have my identity in a positive way. Um, I'm not the only one and um, it, it's, uh, it's certainly important to speak, to work, to study and to transmit this memory to the next generation. Um, and it's, um, um, the, the impact is, it, it's on, on so many levels. It's of course on a, it's on an intimate level because if you come from a family of survivors, there's a lot of trauma, as I said, that wasn't really released immediately. It's, it's going through generations. Um, it's also on a level of relationship with the society around us. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's important to, I mean, there's so many non-Jews it, coming and um, having a dialogue with Jews or a friendship with Jews and um, especially speaking about the Holocaust. But the Holocaust is not the only part of our life. And this is also another, it's, and, and it doesn't have to be the most important part of our life. So on one level, you have a trauma and you have something very, very important to transmit. On the other level, you, you want to live like anybody else, and you also want to transmit to the others that Judaism is something positive and Jewish life is Jewish life. And is, we're not speaking only about people, the, the death of people. Very often I say that Yad Vashem is not a place of death, it's a place of life. And I consider it a place of the life, and I'm also very very pleased that I soon come. I, I, I really consider it a place of life because it's where you, um, you, you, you think that life is, is the most important thing, the life of a human being, that's where we have to start from. So this is the situation uh, our generation is today. And we hope that the next generation um, has taken the life part of it but also not um, uh, without uh, forgetting what is that. But it's not only a matter of forgetting and forgiving. It's a matter of living through. It's a matter of being aware of what happened and carry this on with us and analyzing and continuing studying and analyzing and finding new things. It's a never ending story, but you have to see it through the perspective of life and not through the perspective of death. Thank you very much uh, so for this very positive message and this uh, appeal to life. It's, I think it's very important. Uh, Professor Della Pergola, please. Yes, well, I'm by far the oldest in this panel. And in fact, I, I was there. I am a survivor. I was born in 1942. So I don't remember very much, but I, I know that my parents, my young parents and me, a child, uh, were under German occupation. Uh, the story of our survival has been told by my parents uh, so often. And I remember now little ex excerpts of it. Uh, it's a drama. It's a miracle. It's the proof that there were good Italians. We uh, were saved. We could pass on foot the Italian-Swiss border on the night of Christmas of 1943, escaping from, uh, from fascist and Nazi Italy. And this, this happened very much thanks to uh, people. Four of them have been recognized writers of the nations uh, in Florence. By the way, two Catholics, including the Cardinal of Florence, and two Protestants, including uh, the head of the Evangelical Church in Florence, which is interesting in terms of the ecumenical participation of the good Italians. But uh, my father says that uh, at some point uh, there was a German uh, soldier, one meter from him and from me, and the, and the German soldier said, the, uh, the child uh, is black and curly, and his uh, eyes are so sad, the child must be a Jew. 
And uh, the other soldier said, uh, Hans, uh, let it uh, go and, and let's continue going around. And so uh, the thing passed. You see how, how random can, can be life. But then the fact is that we, we were saved um, and then we returned to uh, destroyed Italy, uh, mentioning numbers, uh, 14 members of our family uh, were killed, uh, both on, on the side of my, my father and my mother. And uh, so th this has been uh, a part of the, of the family history. It has been very influential. I must say that uh, happily, I, I don't think I bear any uh, trauma because of course there are people who carry the results of the tragedy very, very deep in their soul. Uh, not in this case. I, I had the fortune of, of growing up in a, in a very stable environment in Milano. And then, uh, though I have to say this, while the, 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 the memory in the family was very vivid, and uh, certainly it has shaped my personality, my uh, sort of historical outlook as a child, and my future choices, um, it is true, and this has been mentioned, that uh, Shoah in Europe, in Italy, and, uh, and also in other many Western countries uh, was suppressed or repressed for many years. I, I have a pragmatic view of the causes. Immediately after the end of World War II began the Cold War and the public agenda changed totally. There was, uh, to, to, to put it in, in the discourse of that time, the, the good West and the, best so and, and the bad Soviet Union, but many intellectuals and many political leaders in Italy uh, were um, sympathizing for the communist uh, ideology. And therefore much of the intellectual uh, life in Italy from uh, literature to politics uh, to uh, movies, uh, and everything that was creative uh, was very much influenced by, by this uh, new struggle. And so the, the, the position of the Jews was totally marginal. It was totally neglected. There was now a different uh, type of enemies. And uh, so, yeah, the Jewish uh, experience was kind of reduced to a sort of subcategory of resistance, uh, which is totally false. Indeed, ma many Jews militated in the resistenza. Proportionally, uh, Jewish, uh, the Jewish population in Italy was small. It was about reduced to, to less than 30,000 after the Shoah. But uh, during the war, the participation was proportionally high. But, but it's not true that, uh, that uh, resistance was the real thing. The, the real thing was that the Americans came and the British came and they saved Italy from, from the Germans and the, the Italians did what, whatever they, uh, they could. And so, Jewish discourse was totally absent. And of course, the, since the Jewish community in Italy is very much acculturated, I think ma many Jewish families received this message, keep, keep it low, it's not uh, central. Uh, we, we have survived, thanks God. And uh, in Poland, the situation was much worse. And, and think of the Netherlands and, and even Greece. And so let's uh, keep calm and let's reconstruct. There was a huge effort to reconstruct. Uh, in the 60s, Giorgio Bassani wrote, uh, um, a prominent novel, uh, The Garden of Finzi Contini, uh, which attracted attention. And my, my, my interpretation is that that was probably supposed to be one shot. Okay, we have one book, a good book, you won a prize. And so it's, it's over with the Jews. Now let's move to something else. There was Il Gatto Pardo about the, eight, the epos of Sicily and, and other wonderful novels uh, in Italy. And so let, let's move forward. But in reality, uh, discourse uh, has changed gradually. And uh, by, by the way, the movie out of the, of, of the novel, The Garden of Finzi Contini, was perhaps even more influential. And in my humble uh, opinion, I, I'm not a literary person, I'm, I'm a, a numbers person. Uh, the movie was much better than the book. And then it raised some, some attention. And then ma many years later, uh, another uh, movie, uh, this time by Benigni, Life is Beautiful, uh, which is, in my view, uh, much uh, weaker and much poorer than The Garden of Vizzi Contini, but he, he won the Oscar. And so it, it became sort of a legitimate part of general discourse. And gradually, um, there has been a much greater space intellectually and, uh, and culturally and, uh, and also from the point of view of historical consideration, uh, eventually, eventually, uh, a Jewish survivor, uh, Miss Segre, has been elected to, to the Italian Senate uh, for life. So it's kind of giving the Jews late recognition. But I think in this conversation, 
uh, we, don't, we, we have not yet mentioned the, the word, and the word is Israel. Israel uh, sort of uh, was born. In fact, until 1967, it was a very negligible fact, uh, totally ignored, uh, colorful, uh, but, uh, but really not relevant. But after 67, the scene changes. And, and after 67, also, uh, the relationship between the West uh, and, and Eastern Europe changed very, very radically. And, and so the uh, problem or the uh, challenge has become this uh, triangle, the local Jewish identity, identifying with Israel, and keeping memory of the Shoah. Th these are the, the three corners of, of, of a triangle around which uh, Jewish identity, uh, sometimes in very conflictual ways, sometimes in very uh, consonant ways has developed, but nobody can escape the triangle. And people, of course, then make their own choices. People have uh, sometimes shifted very dramatically their preferences from one camp to another. In my own case, I must say that I had uh, been gradually elaborating the history of my parents and the child. And then uh, at some point uh, I went to explore Israel and I thought uh, that, uh, okay, I Italy is nice. I learned in Italy very much. I got my master's in political science in one of the best universities in Europe, in Pavia. And yet I thought maybe I may belong better uh, elsewhere. Uh, let, let's try, let's give it a try. And the rest is history. The last um, kind of 54 years I've lived uh, in Israel. And uh, the story continues. And I think ma many people are still uh, measuring the different options and thinking whether uh, there can be a good synthesis uh, of this. I think this course is open. Unfortunately, I will conclude by saying that in my view, there has been uh, in recent years a very dangerous deterioration in uh, the political conscience of Europeans and maybe also uh, on, the, on another continent uh, more to the west of Europe. And uh, this uh, puts again those uh, famous uh, tragic historical questions in a new light. Is it over or we have to think again and again and over and over? Uh, thank you, Professor, for this uh, very rich um, geopolitical, cultural, and uh, social overview, and also for your personal story. And now, um, Dr. Ayal Nidamogioto, please. Okay, Simonetta and Sergio gave a very comprehensive uh, and fascinating uh, uh, answer, so I will be, uh, maybe I'll add uh, one or two uh, points only. Uh, of course, uh, both my personal uh, uh, family history uh, and in general, the, the, the Holocaust influenced uh, my, uh, my personal uh, uh, identity and choices and, and I think in general society, a Jewish society and non-Jewish society, I agree uh, with, of course, with Simonetta and with Sergio that uh, these are questions that go much beyond uh, the Jewish uh, 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 communities. Um, and, and the influence goes uh, uh, from, from personal choices, uh, political aspects, uh, of course, and uh, developments, uh, and uh, more, on, uh, more on, on, on other aspects. And, and um, uh, of course, uh, we, uh, Simonetta and Sergio both mentioned the, the issue of uh, the memory. When did they start talking about the, uh, that, and as, as I saw also some of the participants uh, mentioned it in the, in the chat, uh, of course this is actually not a unique uh, to Italy. Uh, uh, talking about the Holocaust and starting opening uh, uh, the, the memories much a later stage, also as a result of, of what uh, Sergio and Simonetta said, and also as a result of the, the need of the individual to, to, to start walking again and to start living again. And therefore, uh, uh, it was an existential need uh, to put it aside, um, not only for the issues of identity and reconnecting to the, uh, to the country, but also from a personal and a psychological point of view. So it's a process that takes time. Uh, of course, we know in the 80s, uh, the, the very famous uh, um, um, a Holocaust, the series, the TV uh, series Holocaust with Meryl Streep, that was maybe one of the things that started a, a change uh, uh, worldwide, of course. And this is a process that later came uh, 
were brought to uh, 1988 with the 50 years to the uh, anti-Semitic legislation of 38, all of a sudden we start talking, we start listening to more and more uh, 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 testimonies. So this is a, a, a process and I, I would like maybe only to, to end uh, uh, reconnecting to what Simonetta said. Um, I remember uh, our professor, uh, Israel Gutman, um, maybe rest in peace, uh, who was a survivor and a, a professor of Holocaust uh, history. And he, he, he used to say a very important uh, a thing that I, I think it's still actual today. The Holocaust refuses to become history. It is still something existing, relevant, and I think it connects to all that was said here. Uh, so it will go with us uh, for many more years, differently, of course, uh, and we will have to, to think also about how to perpetuate uh, the memory once we will not have any, uh, also the, the, uh, the, um, the survivors going with us, but this will evolve, and, but the memory will continue because it's relevant to the questions of identity and question of existence, of humankind, of society, and of course, uh, of identity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, also transnational comment and uh, tying up the uh, the story of uh, Italian Jews to other uh, uh, experiences. And if um, if the panelists agree, I would like to open up to the questions. There are many questions in the chat, and of course, because we are talking about an event that happened in Rome, uh, there are a lot of references to uh, the Pope and, and the Vatican. Uh, Patrick Gannon uh, asks, uh, during World War II, uh, Pope Pius XII was criticized for not taking a stance against Nazism and their treatment of the Jews. He was accused uh, for the complicity of silence. Did the Pope make uh, any statements or take any actions on the roundup of the Roman Jews? Um, well, it can be embarrassing to go into the details, but to, to make it simple, no, certainly not. Uh, if he said something, maybe if, uh, providing, provided he said that, he probably said, said uh, well, if it has to be done, do it quick and clean. Uh, not uh, the contrary. I, I must add, uh, and, and here I, I turn to more seriously uh, evaluating my experience in the Committee of the Writers of the Nations. I find that the clergy uh, was very active in saving the Jews, but not so much the clergy in Rome. And let's not forget that uh, the Pope is also the Bishop of Rome. And so he had the, the maximum influence. You, you might have expected that, that thousands of Jews would be saved. This is not the case. Whereas you find in a place like Florence, a different cardinal who is super active and, and really uh, conspirates and, and really organizes uh, with uh, his clergy and the Jews, uh, the, safe, the salvation of, of many Jews in Assisi, a place which is traditionally uh, presenting so many churches and monasteries. There are so many people uh, who did it. But why did, it, why did they do it? And, and, and some have said that explicitly. They did do it because they were good souls, good Christians, not because they had received orders from the hierarchy. It was spontaneous. It was really uh, the good nature of men and women. Uh, men and women, there were nuns and there were friars. And, uh, and this is not an organized action by the church. By the way, Professor Kerzer of Brown University has just released some documents about uh, uh, the kidnapping of Jewish kids, that is the hiding of Jewish kids during the war, and then uh, the non-returning of those kids to the families and, and even the, the trials that had to happen. And, and here we have new documents, which are quite appalling about uh, the internal, uh, uh, communication within the Vatican about uh, what the Vatican should do and, and definitely you find this sense of hostility and contempt toward the Jews by important uh, parts of the hierarchy. Never generalize. I, I was just involved recently in awarding the degree uh, of uh, writers of the nations to Cardinal Tisserand, who was maybe number two or number three uh, in the hierarchy at some point. Uh, so, and, and he was in Rome and, and he protested and he was very, very active and he personally saved uh, people in his home. Uh, but uh, uh, the big leader 
was not there. He was not there mentally. He was not there with his soul. He had uh, probably a geopolitical vision that uh, insisted on uh, not creating more damage to the church. Uh, certainly the Jews were very low in his priorities. I, Rocco, I would like to add something, uh, some stuff. Of course, uh, I think that uh, Sergio and I, on this topic, uh, we have some uh, uh, differences of opinion, uh, although basically we agree on the, on the main issues. Uh, this is a very complex issue and very delicate uh, topic that cannot be discussed, of course, uh, in, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as an answer to a question at the end of a, a lecture. Um, uh, we do have now that the, the archives of uh, Pope Pius XII opened uh, recently, we, we have an opportunity really to, uh, to see uh, the documents, well we don't because we cannot go to Italy uh, due to the COVID-19, but other scholars are able to go there and it will take years and years to an analyze this huge amount of, of, uh, of documentation and very interesting new research will be done and uh, of course Kerzer uh, gave us uh, a first hint of a, a very uh, controversial uh, issue uh, uh, and uh, important, a very traumatic uh, story of the Finale uh, children. But I think that we will need much more time in order to reach some new conclusions. We do know, we do know that the Pope never openly clearly denounced uh, he never said it clearly, the Jews are be killed by the Nazis, by Germans. Uh, uh, he never did it. Uh, he, he, in some of his speeches, he spoke in a, in a, a very unclear uh, way or clear to those who wanted uh, to help Jews, but not clear to those who didn't. Also in the case of the roundup of, of Rome, he actually uh, ordered uh, the Secretary of State to uh, uh, surmount the... the, the, the um, the ambassador, the German ambassador who came and, and uh, the, the Secretary of State begged him to try to do something for those unfortunates, uh, they arrested the Jews, uh, but uh, uh, when asked if the Pope would react, uh, he said that the Pope would not want to be in the position to uh, denounce, to condemn, and therefore uh, uh, the, the, um, the ambassador wrote a few days later saying, well, since I don't believe that uh, uh, there are going to be any more roundups in Rome, I hope that the issue is closed. So this is a very disturbing issue, but again, it is much more complex and we should open a, a more a documentation in order to understand a, the vast a, a, a question. The, we have also to remember a, a very interesting a study done by, done by a, a Grazia Loparco, a, a Catholic historian who a, talks about the hiding of Jews in convents in Rome, again, it raises, it opens question that must be analyzed uh, more in depth um, in order to, to, to get to a, a more complex, uh, complex picture. Um, Just a compliment, if you allow me. In Florence, on that November 1943, under German occupation, Cardinal Elia Dalla Costa, on a Sunday morning, early mess, went to the pulpit and said, there are there outside brothers and sisters who are in danger. Go out and help them. This is a sentence said from the pulpit. This sentence saved my family and myself and many others. Had the Pope said the same from the Vatican during the mass, one sentence, please go out and help. I think the world would be quite different. Rocco, may I? Add yes, something please. personal? Yes, okay. yes, of course. Uh, yes, as Yael said, this is a long discussion and very complex. And uh, I can only say, uh, as it was mentioned at the beginning, the Jews of Rome, they were sized and they were taken into the military college. The military college is just two minutes from the Vatican. As we say, they were under the nose of the Pope. Um, all his life, my father, who has lost his father and his dear brother on that day, they were deported. And um, all his life, he passing in front of the military college, you know, with all the Romans go is, uh, is along the river. And uh, he was mentioning that. He said, we were under the, they were under the nose of the Pope and nothing was done. At the same time, 
as also Sergio mentioned, so many convents opened the doors and the gates. And my father was hidden in a convent in Rome and my grandmother and the other auntie were hidden in a convent. So uh, it's clear that Catholic, uh, the clergy and the, the Catholics had, their, they, they helped a lot. But from the Vatican and until his last days, my father would pass in front of the Vatican and the military college and say, he didn't do anything. And I, I'm not a, st a, a scholar, I'm not looking on documents, I'm just giving testimony. The feeling among the Roman Jews was that there was no order by the political order by the Vatican, but a lot of convents and Catholics and nuns and, and priests help, helped. So this is what happened then. But it, again, it will take time because we still need to research and documents are there. And uh, so no fantasies. Let's go to facts and the facts will speak. Uh, thank you. Definitely uh, um, an, a subject that uh, um, uh, we need to, to give it. It's, uh, it's right time and maybe we should organize an event specifically on this. Um, uh, Sheila Solov asks if uh, there were other uh, roundups of Jews in Italy, um, like, like it happened in Rome. Yes, of course. Uh, in, the, in the weeks after, there were several more roundups uh, uh, going north. Uh, uh, and, uh, and after a, f a first wave of, of roundups, uh, uh, then the majority of the arrests were done uh, individual, individually with uh, arrests with Italian forces that assisted. Uh, so we have it throughout the period, yeah. Add to this, the official date, um, you know, Italy was divided into two, as I said before. So the fascists created the Republic of Salo in the north. And the official date for uh, order of, for arresting the Jews was November 30th. So November, and this is one of the reasons why the Italian Jews do not want to give too much symbolic um, um, you know, meaning to the October 16th because there is an order given at the end that Jews should be arrested and deported. Um, and, and Jews were arrested and deported, like it happened in Milan, it happened uh, in all the cities in the north and not only in the cities. So it was not the very, very beginning because as Yael said before, there were a few episodes before especially in Northern Italy, when the Germans came down, when the Germans entered Italy at the very beginning, there were episodes, but the, but the, um, the, the, the roundup in, in, in Rome was a shock. And it was a shock for the community and a sign because until then, the Jews hadn't really understood the, the, the level of risk. But when this train this uh, cattle train wagon traveled through Italy from September 18th and they stopped in Padua. They stopped in Ferrara. They stopped and that's, and, and some of the Jews inside the train left some messages to, uh, to the, uh, which reached their families, go away, escape, they're taking us. And not only men, because at the beginning, Jews thought that they would come and take the men for hard working, for labor. No, they are taking families. They're taking all of us. And that was, um, was a, a tragic moment, a very, very tragic moment and a desperate moment for Italian Jewry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to read the questions that have been answered already uh, in the chat. Um, there is a question by Nomi Udak. Uh, what was Mussolini's policy towards the Jews? I mean, this is a very complicated question, but maybe 
maybe you can answer like in, uh, in Actually, a Actually, it's a very easy one. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> easy one. I'm glad it's easy. I'm glad it's yes. easy. It, it, Mussolini from, nine, from the beginning, let's say, but officially from 1938, he starts discriminating and persecuting the Jews. And in, it's not only Mussolini, but his entourage and the, with the collaboration of vast uh, part. And in 1940, he decides that the Jews will have to leave Italy within five years, and that's the order that they give to the uh, Italian uh, communities. And then because Italy joins the war, this is, it becomes impossible, so they enlarge the, the number of years, but still the will is that the Jews will leave Italy. In, in this stage, until 1943, it is still not a collaboration with the idea of killing the Jews and uh, the persecution of life, as Michele Sarfatti uh, rightfully uh, uh, names it. So the, the persecution of life starts only in uh, September, or September, October, November uh, uh, 30, 1943. Uh, and from that point on, uh, Mussolini and the Republic uh, of Salon collaborates uh, uh, very, very fiercely and very intentionally with the arrest and deportation uh, uh, of the Jews in order to get rid of the Jews and, by the way, confiscate uh, their property because their property is Italian property. So there is a the, the running after the, the Jews and the hunt of the Jews. Part of it is also to try to get them before the Germans so that the uh, property will remain in Italian hand. So Mussolini it was not the good guy as often is uh, uh, perceived in collective memory. No, he was not. However, if I may yeah. add, Rocco, please, please. Uh, there are a few things that were confusing, uh, not only because uh, Mussolini had, as everybody knows, a Jewish lover, Margherita Sarfatti, but because before 1936, uh, for political reasons, uh, Mussolini had different meetings with Jewish leaders. And, uh, and, and not even that. Um, for political reasons, again, uh, especially anti-British politics, uh, Mussolini, for example, um, helped uh, the uh, building and the creation of a Jewish college in, the, in Rhodes, for example, which was under the island of Rhodes, was under Italian occupation. And, uh, and, and the rabbinical college in Rhodes, uh, which was active since tw from 1926 to 1936, was under uh, the fascist uh, patronate. Um, so somebody might ask, why? And uh, my, my, uh, uh, my professor, my, uh, uh, the Felice was saying that Mussolini was, was dancing uh, whilst it was dancing, you know, was trying to, to use the Jews was trying to use the Jews for his Middle East politics, especially, and for his European politics. But the, the truth is that Mussolini uh, had anti-Jewish feelings from the very beginning. Mussolini was a megalomaniac opportunist. And so he may have had the moments in which his foreign policy, especially anti-British, uh, led in a certain direction. But, uh, uh, besides the Jewish lover, uh, he had uh, a much more famous uh, uh, local mistress, Claretta Petacci. And the diary of Petacci is quite revealing because this is a very simple woman. Uh, she simply loved him and, uh, and she writes the truth, whatever he told her uh, in the evenings when he came back home. And uh, very early, late 20s, early 30s, he says to Claretta, I hate those Jews, I can't stand those Jews. It's, it's beyond me. Mussolini was a, an unstructured anti-Semite, but he had sometimes some political uh, interests. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Paul Levy has a, has a question about the Jewish community in Pitigliano. What happened to them uh, during the, um, the Holocaust? Well, the, the truth is that I, I do not have numbers now about uh, what happened in Pitigliano. Pitigliano was a very, very tiny rural community. The people, uh, uh, some uh, could uh, move elsewhere. The, the, truth, the truth is that uh, now, if, if we go back, I mean, there are so many contradictions. And the behavior of the Italian uh, um, military police, the Carabinieri, 
and, and, and of other uh, people uh, who were uh, part of the regime uh, it ca cannot be reconducted to one model. So there were uh, ma many good uh, soldiers and many good uh, policemen who warned the Jews, uh, helped them to, 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 to move into hiding, uh, transferred them, uh, helped them to, to move from, from one place uh, to, to another, and sometimes uh, even liberated them. So that, that's, uh, again, uh, spontaneous local initiatives by, by good men, uh, willing opposers of this uh, tragic uh, scenario, whereas you have others who willingly complied and uh, made every possible effort to find the Jews on the top of the mountain, on the bottom of the river, uh, an isolated Jews, uh, very old, who was just hiding and, and just captured that person. So it's, uh, it's uh, maybe uh, uh, frustrating that you, you, we cannot give a, a precise answer. And, and, and this is also one more consideration, uh, a function of the ability of, of individuals to, to, to have ideas on how to, to hide, how to find the proper uh, relations and uh, very much the fortune they had during those tragic moments. And so we know that in certain cities, uh, the balance sheet of Holocaust is higher and elsewhere it is lower. It may depend on, uh, on the initiative of a local rabbi who closed the synagogue and of uh, some good person who helped uh, the Jews. So one thing let's avoid, and that's a generalization. There is no myth of the good Italian. Uh, many Italians were very bad, but there were indeed many good Italians. I need to uh, barge in. I apologize. This is a fascinating discussion. A very special and unique panel. I myself, working in Yad Vashem, have learned an enormous amount and would happily continue this discussion and ask many more questions. I do hope we have another opportunity, Yael and the rest, Roko and all the rest, to continue this fascinating uh, topic. There's endless uh, points of view to be learned and to be studied. So I really would like to say thank you very, very much to all of you and to all the participants. I think uh, uh, this was really provocative and, 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 and made me think a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.